When we think about ecology, we think about Greta Thunberg, we think about the young people, about the supposed engaged generation. And even though there are a lot of young people that are engaged, there are also a lot of people older that are super engaged. And today I'm super delighted to receive Jeremy Rifkin. He's an American economist and a social tourist. He's a writer, a public speaker, and an activist. He has wrote 22 books about the impact of scientific and technological change on the economy. And he's the, probably one of the most important person when it comes to ecology. He has been advised Europe, uh, China, but also the US when it comes to the transformation of the society. And he just released a book called The Age of Resilience, in which he talks about the evolution of society and what we are going to be in the next coming decades. It is a very, very interesting conversation as he has a very unique way of describing what we are going through, but also moving forward to. I loved that conversation. I'll let you listen to it. Allez, venez. C'est parti. So hi, everyone. Hi, Jeremy. Hi. Very good. Nice to be with you. Very nice to be with you. Thanks very much for uh, taking time uh, to discuss with me. So you're working a lot with uh, government. Um, Uh, especially in Europe and in the US. And I would like to understand uh, what is your vision of the evolution of those uh, government regarding ecology? Because you've been one of the top, I guess, uh, mind or one of the most, most important person talking about ecology this uh, last uh, year, decade, uh, somehow. Well, I've had the the uh, I've been working on um, the climate change issues and the fossil fuel complex since 1973. So it's been quite a while. Yeah, you know, since about the 50th year. Um, I've been privileged to be um, a principal architect of the European Union's plans going forward over the last 20 years uh, with the European Commission, and over the last 10 years with the leadership of the uh, People's Republic of China. Um, much of the um, of uh, what we've been engaging in found its way into the 13th and 14th five-year plans. And in the last two years, uh, I worked with Senator Charles Schumer, the majority leader of the U.S. Senate, and uh, we developed a 25-year uh, a -year plan for him, which became uh, central components of the Build Back Better Biden plan. So um, our companies uh, were not academic. It's uh, industries, uh, companies all over the world that actually Uh, are aware of how to actually deploy a complete transition to a third industrial revolution infrastructure to address climate change and age of resilience. But let me start off, if I can, just with a frame of reference for uh, why I wrote The Age of Resilience. I started the book nine years ago, and it's based on my experience over the last half centuries on what went wrong and what we need to do to change the story, because we're running out of time. Totally. Uh, our... Uh, I think that w what's really happening right now is that pandemics are going to continue. Get used to it. Because when my dad was born in 1908, 85% of the planet was still wilderness, no humans, no development. Now it's 24%. It's going down to zero. So the bacteria, the viruses, they're, they're climate migrants. They're moving closer and closer to our urbanized civilizations. This is a reality. And now, of course, real-time climate change. Uh, in the last two years, all over the world, people now realize this is the new normal. The floods, the droughts, the heat waves, the wildfires, the hurricanes, the massive snows in the winter. It's destroying infrastructure, undermining ecosystems, and people are dying. So I think what's happened in just the last two years, there is this understanding going on, but no one's talking about it. Everyone's beginning to realize, and this is a big shift, that this earth we live in, this planet, is much more powerful than we ever thought. And our species is much smaller and not very significant to the future evolution of this planet, especially with a rewilding climate. That is a huge shift in consciousness that actually no one wants to talk about. And the reason this is happening, there's a history of this. It goes way back to the beginning of civilization. If you go back to the first historical document, the Book of Genesis, The Garden of Eden, we all study that in school mm -hmm. or uh, in our religious institutions. The Lord said to Adam and Eve, you, you, you defied my order not to eat that apple from the tree of knowledge. I'm going to expel you from the garden. 
but I'm going to give you a gift. He said, Adam, I'm going to let you have dominion over all of life on earth. You shall be the masters of nature. That idea in Western civilization has taken us all the way through the agricultural revolutions, the great hydraulic civilizations, all the way to the industrial age, and it culminated in the age of progress. And what this means is that we have, in this amount of time, we depleted the earth. We actually have. The age of progress is the final, if you will, moniker of this. And it was uh, the aristocrat, uh, uh, Condorcet, the great French aristocrat, who was a revolutionary in 1794. They were trying to get him to the guillotine. <laughs> so he penned a little essay just before he died. And he said, it was called Progress. And he said, there is no limit to the perfection of humanity except the uh, globe itself. This is progress. That's the worldview we're in. And the problem with this worldview is it's all the set of assumptions of this worldview that's taken thousands of years to germinate and then culminate in the industrial age that's taken us to extinction. We are in the sixth extinction event of life on Earth. This is no small thing. The last extinction was 65 million years ago, and it took millions of years for life to come back. This extinction event's happening in one, uh, one century. The little babies today are going to grow up in an extinction event. So the question is, how did we get here? We got here in the, in the route I'm talking about, but then the thing we don't want to speak about is it's all the set of assumptions of the age of progress that's taken us to extinction, not just the fossil fuels, the way we organize governance, our approach to economic life, our, um, our ways of having scientific inquiry, our relationship to nature, how we educate our kids, our notion of selfhood, all of these ideas that culminated in the rational, detached age of progress in the Industrial Revolution have taken us to extinction. So it's not something we're talking about, which we have to do, because we can't cure the problem using these assumptions. We need a new playbook. And I started this book nine years ago with the idea that to understand changes in history, you have to understand changes in temporal and spatial identity. This is what determines changes in history. So there are great infrastructure shifts, and those infrastructure shifts change our, our temporal and spatial orientation. What does it mean? Everyone thinks an infrastructure just roads and bridges and stuff, right? No. Infrastructures uh, bring together new forms of communication, new sources of energy, new mobility and logistics to bring larger numbers of people together in shorter time spans to communicate power and move day-to-day -day life. All right. So infrastructures actually determine the kind of governing systems that those infrastructures allow. Infrastructures determine the kind of economic systems that those infrastructures allow and the kind of social systems. It's not the other way, the other way around. All right. So if you take a look at um, where we are now, our temple spatial orientation comes out of our infrastructures, the first and second uh, industrial revolutions. Mm -hmm. And what they tell us is that we came up with a completely new idea of a temporal idea. It's called efficiency. Everyone thinks that everybody's been efficient since the first forager hunters. Not so. The time value of all of our species all the way through history until the last several hundred years was adaptivity, not efficiency. Every species, including our own, has biological clocks in our body, in our cells, in our organs, in our tissues that are constantly negotiating uh, with the solar day, the seasonal rhythms, and our rotation around the sun. In other words, our planet, our, our body is part of that uh, temporal orientation that's imprinted in the entire Earth, all right? What happened with efficiency is this. About for 90% of the time we were on this planet, we adapted to nature like every other species, all right? 10,000 years ago, the last ice age receded, nice weather, good climate. We settled <laughs> down. We are designed to be forager hunters, but we settled down to sedentary life, agriculture, uh, pastoralization, then the big hydraulic civilization, all the way to the industrial age. And in this 10,000 years, we have reversed course. Instead of adapting to nature like we did for 800,000 years as hominid, we made nature adapt to us. Mm -mm, mm -mm. That took us to the extinction. So let me talk about efficiency because it's such a strange phenomena. Totally. Yeah. We all think that's life. Efficiency is extracting greater volumes of the Earth's spheres, the lithosphere, the hydrosphere, the atmosphere, and biosphere, extracting greater volumes of these spheres that make life possible 
in higher speeds and shorter time intervals. Then we wonder why we depleted the earth. There you go. <laughs> Once you recognize this, it's common sense. It's just not in any textbook, unfortunately. And then, uh, and then you take a look at, at our spatial values. From almost all of history, we considered the planet as a commons, forager, hunters, early agriculture, even the great hydraulic civilizations. We understood that nature was our commons. Now, the physiocrats, the first French economists said, yeah, the big wealth is photosynthesis. That's it. That's what creates wealth. Well, John Locke came along, the Brit, and he said, no, 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 no. He said, nature's waste. That's his exact term. It's useless and valueless. That's his exact English words. Wow. It only becomes valuable when human labor transforms it to capital. And so the role of government is to, prop, is to commodify pro and, and safeguard property. And all of the earth becomes property. Like 40% of the oceans are now property of governments. Yeah, that's insane. The lithosphere, the soil, it's all property. And so the key here is, is this following statistic. We are less than 1% of the biomass of the earth, human beings. We're using 24% of the net primary production right now, photosynthesis. We're going to be using 44% of photosynthesis and net primary production by 2050. That's extinction. Can't be done. So what we're beginning to see is a shift from efficiency back to adaptivity, but in a more sophisticated way. We're not going to be four hunters. And we're beginning to see that the age of progress is dead and the age of resilience is, is ascending. I'm sure you're seeing it in your podcasts, et cetera. People are talking about adaptivity and resilience. They're just not mm. sure what it is. They're not I was going to ask, actually, what, what is resilience in, in, your, in your opinion? Well, so the problem with, with uh, uh, efficiency is tied to a twin called productivity. Our inputs versus the outputs. And the more efficient you are, the more productive you are. There's no such thing as productivity in nature. Ecosystems don't have productivity. They have regenerativity. Regenerativity. There's no productivity. So that just takes us on the wrong course. All right? And nature isn't about growth. It's about flourishing. All right? And in, in, in nature... Um, uh, it's not about eliminating the friction. You know, in, in, in business, you have to eliminate all the friction to be more efficient. You don't want to have mm -hmm. too much inventory. You don't want to have too much, uh, too many workers uh, because then you can't <laughs> send the investment, the, the revenue back to the investors. You certainly don't want to have um, a lot of, um, uh, of uh, idle assets for logistics. Well, guess what? When COVID hit, everybody started to realize, uh-oh, efficiency is the problem. Where are the <laughs> ventilators? Where are the masks? Where is the toilet paper. <laughs> I know it's amusing if it weren't so sad. So in nature, it's really about um, not productivity, but regenerativity. And there's another mm -hmm. problem. So when you eliminate all of these redundancies to make it more efficiency, you eliminate resilience. Nature is designed to be redundant. The more diverse an ecosystem the better able it is to survive against climate events or any other events. If you have an mm -hmm. ecosystem that's not diverse and redundant, but monocultured and simplified, it's vulnerable to collapse. Mm -hmm. And what I'm getting to and what I'm putting across in the book is that it's not that nature is just something we can learn from. We are nature. And yeah. when we try to adapt nature to us and see civilization is separate from nature, we get lost. Um, and I think that's a big it's a really big lesson to learn here. Uh, and we better learn it very soon because we're in trouble. Yeah, and that, that, that's the, the crazy thing. We, we are having a hard time. There's this uh, very famous quote that is, uh, it's easier to imagine the end of the world than the end of uh, capitalism. And it's- uh, well, Yes. <laughs> <laughs> oh boy, you got me on this now. All right, so look. <laughs> I know that a lot of, look, one of the things I appreciate about the Gen Zs, and they're probably a lot of your audience and the young millennials, they're doing something really significant. And that is, uh, Millions of them have come out on these Friday for Future uh, Fridays where they leave classes, 143 countries, millions of young people, and they're protesting. But these aren't like any protests in history. We've had protests all through history. Our species loves to protest. We do it. But it's I met with French. three of these young people in Milan a couple of years ago when they started this, and it dawned on me. 
This isn't like any protests in history, these peaceful protests. This is the first time in all of history that a human, the human beings have come out on the streets and seen themselves as a species, a species. All the old divisions, religious, ideological, location, gone. We're a species in danger. That's never happened. There's no other. It's just a species. Then they're starting to see their fellow creatures as part of their evolutionary family in danger. This is a huge shift, like the other shift, seeing that nature's much bigger than we thought and we're much smaller and less significant. When you put these two together, it signals the beginning of a completely new sense of consciousness. And where it becomes very real is when we relearn what the human body is all about. This is not in the textbooks. The NIH, the National Institute of Health, famous, the most august scientific body in the world, mm -hmm. they've changed the scientific paradigm. They have a new project. It's called the human biome. They have formally recognized that a human being is an ecosystem, not a metaphor. This is not a metaphor. And what they're learning is fascinating. And everyone that listens to your podcast, especially young people, are going to get so comforted because now they're frightened and they think nature is the enemy. They're going to be very comforted. What they're finding is that we, each of us is unique. But like every other species, we are an ecosystem. And the, the, the great spheres of the earth, the hydrosphere, the waters, the lithosphere, the soil, the plants, the trees, the animals, the atmosphere, the oxygen is coming in and into us in molecules and establishing itself in the cells, the organs, and the tissues for a moment of time. Then it goes somewhere else. It leaves us. The water, without the water, that's 60% of the body, you know, we're dead. But it's coming and going, and those molecules go somewhere else. The phosphorus in my teeth came from mountains. All right, like the other elements. The water degrades the mountains, and as the mountains degrade into sediment, then the soil gets built up, and those elements then go to the plants, then to the animals, then back to our bodies. That's going somewhere else after that That's thing from insane. the mountain called phosphorus is in my body. Then it gets even more interesting. It turns out that our bodies are replaced, 90% of the body every 10 years, totally replaced. The average mature adult body is only 10 years old. Except for our eyes, the lens, nerve cells in the brain, and, um, and the phosphorus in the teeth were replaced. Our skeleton is actually totally replaced every 10 years. Our liver every year. Our stomach cells every month. So we are a medium. We are an ecosystem. Then it gets even more interesting. What NIH has shown is that we're not alone in our body, folks. <laughs> There's all sorts of other creatures we barely know all inside our body at every moment. We have not just the bacteria and viruses, protists, archaea, fungi, trillions of these other microorganisms in this ecosystem. And guess what? A majority of the cells in the human body are not human cells. They belong to these other creatures. And we're 20,000 genes in our body. There are millions of other genes that do not belong to us. We are an ecosystem. And then there's our biological clocks that are constantly in our cells and organs and tissues, synchronizing, temporally adapting to the changes in the rotation of the earth every 24 hours, the tidal seasons every lunar season, the circannual seasons as we rotate around the sun. So we're beginning to understand this is so comforting. Each of us is unique, but we are intimately engaged as an ecosystem within ecosystems. We're part of a living planet absolutely a living planet. And so therefore, instead of being frightened and moving to the metaverse and sitting there on a screen with our avatar and a bunch of pixels, we've got to reacquaint ourselves and readapt back to the natural world. So from your point of view, how do we get to this uh, resilient uh, society? How do we get resilient ourselves? Like, uh, is it by understanding that we are uh, an ecosystem? Because what I see is It's, I mean, and, uh, you, and you've seen it much better than I did because you've been in that sphere so, for so many years. It's not moving that fast, actually. Uh, we are very much into this, uh, this thinking. I mean, I, I would connect it with, uh, with uh, Descartes, basically. Uh, yeah. And we, we, have, we are having a hard time moving uh, to, to, an, an, to, the, to the society you're describing, actually. Well, you know, Descartes uh, and Newton's idea of a mechanical universe and, and the world is made up of, uh, is rash, uh, we are rational, detached creatures, and we make nature uh, 
adapt to us. There was always a minority report in the Romantic era and the age of the Enlightenment. For every uh, for every Immanuel Kant, there was a Schopenhauer. And for every Newton, there, there was a Goethe. All right. And in the 19th century, it was in Europe where they created a new science called ecology. In the 20th century, it was the movement in America for the national parks and in in, in uh, and ecology in the 19th century. In the 20th century, the green movement and the environmental movement. All right. So there's a, there's a, a second, uh, if you will, story, which is a minority, but is about to become center stage. So I'm going to share with you my uh, these are things that we've noticed. Our global team has been involved now for a long time with the European Union helping develop their plan, which is now Digital Europe Green Deal. The leadership of China, we call that Internet Plus, the Ecological Civilization, 13th, 14th, five-year plan. And we've just done the plan uh, for Senate, uh, the Senate Majority Leader Schumer, uh, mm-hmm. which got became the components for the Build Back Better plan for Biden. And what we've learned, and these are not academics, in deploying – is changes are going on as we shift to this new third industrial revolution infrastructure that's digitized and localized, et cetera. It's changing uh, the way we organize our economic life so dramatically that this third industrial revolution, which we coined in 1995, is morphing beyond what we thought it would be. And by mid-century, it'll be the end of that third industrial revolution and the beginning of the resilient infrastructure revolution. Absolutely. Absolutely. Mm-hmm. We never saw that as it developed. It became something other than we expected. So here are some of the changes. We're seeing a shift, not yet at the center, but from growth to flourishing. Mm. From finance capital to ecological capital. More and more talk about ESG. We're seeing a shift from productivity to regenerativity. Nature is about regenerativity. From GDP to growth to quality of life indicators. From hyper-consumption to eco-stewardship. These young millennials and Gen Zs, they're all turning vegan. Mm -hmm. We're seeing a shift from negative externalities to circularity. And we're seeing a shift from seller-buyer markets to provider-user networks. And from vertically integrated giant global corporations to laterally distributed small and medium-sized enterprises, all high-tech, in cooperative, blockchain in fluid platforms, so they're very agile, can come and go with whatever happens to the climate. Instead of these big, huge, vertically integrated organizations of the first and second industrial revolution that that all the way went to Microsoft and Google and Facebook, they're not gonna be here in 30, 40 years from now. They're too stodgy. They can't adjust. They're not agile. Climate change is too big for them. Mm-hmm. So you're gonna see, some of them will survive, but you're gonna see more a shift to these um, uh, distributed, laterally scaled SMEs, high-tech cooperatives, localized around the world. Uh, I'll come back to that in a moment. We're moving from intellectual property rights. The young people want open source sharing of knowledge, not intellectual property rights. They mm-hmm. want it free. We're we're moving from the idea of um, of freedom as exclusivity, be an island to ourselves, to the idea of freedom as inclusivity. The more people in the network, the more everyone benefits from the network. It's not a zero-sum game. And from um, uh, geopolitics to biosphere politics. So let me go back to um, this idea of uh, having diverse, agile businesses that can be like ecosystems. Let's say you're an architect. I'll give you one example. Cuccinella is a big architect in Italy. But mm-hmm. A lot of architects now are developing printed houses with fabrication, 3D printing. You know, where they print out the whole house with software. You know about this. So what Cuccinella did is he took clay, which all homes before this time were either for chimber or clay, and he heats up the clay, and he develops the software, and the clay then builds up the house layer by layer by layer, and you get a whole house in 200 hours down to 24 hours. All right? And it's passive zero emission. It's resilient to climate events. And then if he wanted to, and others are doing this on a bigger scale now, he could send that software from Italy to the Philippines Mm -hmm. in one minute on a provider user network, not a seller buyer market. And that developer could get a license to use that software to develop uh, those commercial buildings or homes right there on the spot, resilient, working with nature rather than against nature with soil, et cetera. Magnify that across the entire uh, business community that's moving from uh, additive to, uh, from subtractive to additive manufacturing and, and fabrication printing. They're doing bridges now. They're doing windmills now, all with this printing. 
That's just one example. So I think it's there's a lot of things moving. And in the book, and none of this is an idea. All of this is just our watching as we've deployed all of the yeah. merge. It is not yet replaced, but it's we are sure that the age of progress is on a death knell. We are sure the age of resilience is coming. But the question will be, can we reset quick enough? And the problem with adaptivity is it's been our blessing and our curse. Mm -mm. Let me explain. The Smithsonian Institution. If you've ever visited Washington, you've visited all the great Smithsonian museums. Uh, have you done that yet? You've been there to D.C.? I did, because I was living in New York, so <laughs> I've been to Washington, D.C. also. So the Smithsonian Institution did a study which will find heart for everyone listening to this broadcast, pod, uh, podcast. They went back and asked, how did human beings survive all through history? Because we're kind of a weak, little, spindly creature with only two legs, uh, no hair, uh, no fur, uh, uh, weak. Very weak. So the old theory that you and I grew up on was, okay, the last ice age receded around 11,000 years ago. That was the end of the Pleistocene. The Holocene emerged nice weather, really good arid climate. So we got out of the trees. We learned how to walk on our legs. And hominid then crossed the world, and that was it. Well, they went back and looked at the geological record, and it absolutely didn't happen that way. Hominids, that's our ancestors, started to emerge 800,000 years ago, ending up with Neanderthal and then Homo sapiens a couple hundred thousand years ago. When you look at the geological record, the Smithsonian found out that our species existed in the most wild, changing climates you can ever imagine. So on the average, you'd have 100,000 years of ice age everywhere, then only about 10,000 years of a warming thaw, then another thousand years of ice age, then a thaw. This went on over and over again for hundred thousands of years, for 800,000 years, and it had to do with the rotation of the planet. How did we survive? We were the most adaptive species, except maybe for viruses and bacteria. Why? Big brain, a lot of cells up there, neocortex, language. We could then find out what was going around and learn from it and then pass it on, pass it on to generations. That's our big suit. So if we learned, for example, how a beaver made a dam, we could do that. And then we pass the knowledge on and we can make our buildings like that, I guess our dams. Mm -hmm. uh, if you see how a bird makes a nest, well, we can make a shelter somewhere with thatched roofs, all right? That was our strong suit. The problem was 10,000 years ago after the last ice age, we used our adaptivity in an opposite way. We settled down with sedentary life. We're still built to be forager hunters. And we made nature adapt to us rather than us to adapt mm -hmm. to nature. Mm -hmm. Starting with the book of Genesis all the way to progress. The reset now is we got to relearn how to adapt ourselves to nature, but we're not going to go back to primitive forage and hunting. Mm -hmm. There will be a lot of migratory, absolutely. Less sedentary, more migratory, because we're going to have to follow the climate as it rewiles re re the earth. But what we're beginning to do is use much more sophisticated approaches to science and education and everything else. So maybe we could chat about that if you like. Yeah, I, I would love to, to, to understand how, how, because what I love about your book and uh, what you're describing right now, it's a, it's a very positive uh, view on, I feel like at least there's a hope somehow that we're going to change within the, the next coming decades. Because what I see a lot is a lot of dystopia everywhere. And uh, what you're describing is actually, I don't know about positive, but to me it is positive. Uh, because I feel it's more natural, I would say. Um, it feels natural to, to adapt to nature instead of uh, adapt nature to us. So, uh, well, yeah. It's I'll, interesting why you say that, because I started this book about nine years ago. Uh -uh. It's common sense. Any high school graduate, it's, it's not easy, but the minute you say something in there, they say, oh, yeah. Yeah, that's common sense. You follow me? It's The problem is, again, all of our academic disciplines, really from the Enlightenment all the way to the Age of Progress, had a whole set of assumptions that didn't make any sense, all right? And it took us to depletion. I, really, it, I'm sorry. So what's happening in science is there's a new science. The old science is Francis Bacon. Francis Bacon was a bit of a strange character. Francis Bacon said man was not made for the earth. The earth was made for man, right out of the book of Genesis, all right? And uh, he said, we will shake her to her foundation, the earth. Uh, he was a bit of a misogynist, to say the least, all right? <laughs> It will shake her to her foundation. 
And of course, that was the beginning of science. Knowledge is power. So the idea of modern science is to detach ourselves from nature and be a detached observer, a voyeur. Then we use inductive and deductive thinking to wrest nature's secrets so that we can then adapt nature to our utilitarian needs. Then we wonder why we're in an extinction event. <laughs> there is a new science called complex adaptive social ecological systems modeling, C-A-S-E-S. And what they're finding now, and this is going on in the scientific community, a younger generation of scientists, it's really uh, empowering. What they're finding is the academic disciplines are too siloed. If you're an anthropologist, you only know that. If you're a biologist, you only know that. If you're an economist, you only know that. And what they're doing now is they break open the silos. Every one of these disciplines has something to offer, but the planet is a very complex, self-evolving, living uh, sphere. The hydrosphere, the lithosphere, the atmosphere, the biosphere, they're ev mm -hmm. evolving in ways every day. And so the idea is we're never going to adapt nature to us. It's too big. But if we're observant, we can anticipate and then respond to what happens around us in the, in the ecosystems of the planet all the time. And complex adaptive systems thinking allows us to think interdisciplinary and more mindful and be more cognitive and as it moves through our school systems, it will see and change the way young people orient themselves in time and space, et cetera. But then there's another problem, and that's our educational system. When little kids are born, they're born with the most important part of, our, uh, of who we are. And our ability to adapt is, has to do with our, our neural circuitry. It's empathic. Mm, mm. We actually have empathy in our neural circuitry. It's not here. It's through our whole body. And everything is really based around our empathic neural circuitry. We think elephants may have it because they can recognize themselves in a mirror. We're not sure about dolphins and no whales. They may be able to do so as well. Mm. But it's our strong suit because when I empathize with another, it can be a human being, it can be with an animal, I can experience their desire to flourish as if it was my own. In my body, I actually feel that experience, whether it's trauma or jubilation. And that's the time where we transcend time and space and we become one. We understand we are one with the earth we're in. And when you look back at life, that's what everybody remembers, those moments. Absolutely. Totally. So what we're beginning to see now is that that empathic impulse has to be nurtured. It can die. There are many times in history where it inflates and then collapses, inflates and collapses. And, there's a, and so we have to put it into our, our uh, parenting more more effectively and we have to realize that little bait little toddlers after they embrace empathically with their caregiver then they want to scamper around and see the world and then they want to come back and make sure they're safe just like our primate friends then they want to scamper a little further then come back and safe and they find that little toddlers between two and five years of age their their most common dream is uh so 60 percent of their dreams are about other animals baby animals mainly because they see the little ants and they're picking up little food and they're mm. traveling with it or they, they see the, 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 uh, the squirrel making a nest. They, they get it. When they get to school, they're taught, uh-uh, nature's passive resources. It's waste. It's not valuable until you turn it into property and you have to be detached and you have to adapt nature to us. The schools have to change. They have to teach interdisciplinary. And my country's a little head here. We're a little ahead on this one. Eight of the 12 biggest public school systems in America, millions of kids. Ecology is now into curriculum, not as a course, but as a frame for all the other disciplines. Right. That's and perfect. then the kids have to do service learning. They have to go out clinically in the communities and steward their ecosystems, um, um, uh, um, be able to steward their fellow creatures, make sure that uh, the ecosystems aren't toxified and all of that stuff. And this means we have to move to bioregional governance. Our, our, our governments don't make sense the way they are. Climate disasters do not care about political boundaries. They couldn't no. care less about a political boundary. They care about ecosystems. Climate disasters affect ecosystems all over the world. We're beginning to realize that we have to have bioregional governance. We're not going to give up all the governing we have nations and regions and localities, we have to extend it. And this is the only place where America's ahead. 
We have two massive bioregional governments that have been around for 30 years. They're a model. The Cascadian Northwest, if you've ever visited there, mm-hmm. beautiful country. Those uh, states, Washington, Oregon, Idaho, et cetera, five of those states are in a bioregional governance with Canadian provinces, British Columbia, Manitoba, et cetera. And they actually are stewarding their whole ecosystem because that's where they have to be able to adapt back to their bioregions. And it works. It works. Then the the eight states that abut the Great Lakes and the two uh, Canadian provinces, they're 30 years. They're in a complete e- uh, bioregional governance pattern. It's very real because they realize that's their ecosystem. And those Great Lakes are 20% of all the fresh water on the earth you know, on those lakes. 20% of all the fresh water on the whole that's planet. Mm-hmm. So this is, but then you have to get towards citizens' assemblies. Because we're finding out that local governments by and alone, they can't deal with something like climate change. It's too big. They don't have enough. Uh, uh, they don't have enough to do that. They don't have the backup support. So you get a, a, a drought, a wildfire, a flood, a hurricane, a frigid snow. Power lines go down. Everything goes down. Everybody comes out informally. You get the students. You get the food kittens, k- kitchens. You get the health clinics. They're all coming out, but that's too informal, because now these climate events are daily, weekly, and monthly, and they're going to get worse. We're going to have to adjust. We have to get to zero emissions, but we're going to have to adjust to the age of resilience. So citizens' assemblies are formalizing now so that you have people at any given time who engage with local government to manage their ecosystems for resilience and adaptivity and resilience. And there are certain countries that are ahead here. Any country that has juries, civilian juries, are ahead of the game. Uh, A lot of English-speaking countries have it. Other countries have judges only. Mm -hmm. So in my country... Eight million people are called up randomly to be on a jury on criminal and civil cases. Right. 1.8 right. million people actually serve. Twelve men and women have to be on a jury listening to the most complicated criminal and civil cases, financial, criminal, everything. And they have to come up with a unanimous verdict, and they do it almost always. When anyone that says citizens aren't capable, look at the jury system. That has to be extended. But then the young people from education on have to learn about ecosystems. So when on a jury in their uh, citizens assembly, they understand the ecosystems they're in. And none of this is rocket science. This is just common sense. I told, I mean, that's that's the most insane thing. Like we 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 cannot. It's it's very weird, actually, from my point of view, that we are not connecting with that common sense you're describing since uh, since we 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 started talking. C- can I ask you a question about the people in power, uh, politician power? Because you are working with them worldwide. You, you've been describing it, whether it's in Europe or the Senate in the U.S. or in China. And from from a, a civilian point of view, um, we feel like. It's not moving very fast. I mean, uh, look at the the I mean the, the football World Cup in Qatar, or look at the uh, you know the um, it's it's ridiculous, but uh, the 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 winter game in Saudi Arabia. Those are two examples. But I mean, what we we don't really see the movement within politicians to to go into this uh, rigid age that you're describing, and that's uh, for me very. Uh, Well, you know, it's interesting. Um, I'll share an anecdote with you. Uh, I work with um, UNIDO, United Nations Industrial Development Organization, Yom Kala, when he was president. We came to an understanding. It was embarrassing understanding. We were almost (laughs) embarrassed to come to it. We realized at a certain point that the developing world, their liability was their asset. What we meant by this is they didn't have any infrastructure. They didn't have any old codes, old regulations, old standard, vested interests in business that they wanted to keep what they had so they could leapfrog all right and sure enough much of the new solar and wind now in the last few years is in the developing countries with women creating cooperatives in the rural areas for sharing electricity with sun and wind really amazing and so it's much easier in some ways but they need the financing but the money Mm -hmm. is there there's 11 trillion dollars that have come out of fossil fuels it's all stranded assets the fossil fuel industry knows it's over They're not financing new exploration anymore. They're just taking the existing um, reserves and hiking the price to see right. whatever they can get back in the short run. It's a desperate mm-hmm. end game. But $11 trillion dollars have come out. 
and it's mainly run by the pension funds. That's 41 trillion. Karl Marx would turn over in his grave. It turns <laughs> out that the capitalists are the millions and millions of workers. They're the largest fund of capital in the world. He didn't know that was going to happen. Then you have the insurance funds. They definitely are getting are getting out. 21, 22 trillion. And you know what they're saying to me everywhere we go? We've got all this money and we have no deployable scale projects. Everything is a pilot or silo. So if you go to the 11,000 mayors who signed up for the climate, they will show you their five electric buses, their 10 lead buildings, and their new bike paths. They're all pilots. So right. what the, the investment community is saying, the pension funds, insurance funds, we've got all this money sitting in Federal Reserve notes and no interest rate. We need big projects by regions. That means if you had bioregional governance and you could begin to organize deployable infrastructure, and as you know, uh, we began the third industrial revolution planning back in 1995, first mm -hmm. page of the book, End of Work. And so that third industrial revolution infrastructure can come in, uh, we believe, in 20 years, everywhere. The first industrial revolution in the 19th century came in in 30 years. The second one in the 20th century came in in 25. They changed everything. The third one can come in in 20, but we need a new generation educated, a new generation going into politics. We have a new generation going into business who think along the lines that I'm sharing in this book. This is the bits and pieces have to be a story that goes way beyond what's in this book. But it's the beginning of a conversation. And I know people feel um, helpless at this point. Mm -hmm. They don't have to be. We are the most adaptive species. We just have to adapt back to nature. And all of the elements are there for getting the job done. But you're right. We have to change the school system. We have we have one generation. Science, one generation. Our uh, economy, one generation. Our governance, one generation. And we're running out of time. Yeah. So and, and, the, and, the, and Z's got to get going. Perfectly. Perfectly. Um, thanks very much, Jeremy. It's so interesting. I, I love that conversation because it's, uh, you have so much experience in that field and you, you are talking with so many people. And I mean, the book is actually amazing. Uh, I feel like, first, because... To me, I mean, again, I'm repeating myself, but to me, it's kind of positive. Uh, it's giving a, um, somewhere to look at that is not like uh, the end of uh, of the species, or because there, there's so much uh, about that these days. I guess um, the podcast, uh, the name of the podcast is Vlan, and in French, it means um, slamming the door to. Basically, that's what you would see in cartoons. And I have a, a last question for you. Um, I would like to say one more thing before oh, you Oh, yeah, go ahead. Me. Sure, go ahead. Remember I mentioned em empathy is our strong suit. It's in our neural circuitry. Uh -huh. It allows us to be able to experience the others ourselves right here. All right? There's a problem. Empathy, I wrote a book called The Empathic Civilization. Totally. Uh, it took 10 years. My wife's, it's 600 pages. My wife said, who's going to read that? I wrote it for <laughs> myself. All right? I admit. Okay? Some people read it. But when I look back at history, what's interesting is the empathic impulse inflates and then it could collapse. And there's a reason. When you go back to forager hunters, they had empathy, but only for their immediate blood ties and okay. their kindred, kinship group. If you were another human group and two valleys away, you were a demon. Hmm. When we, and so when we went to the great hydraulic civilizations with the dams and the dikes and the royal granaries and indenturing thousands of people and taking them away from their little uh, villages and their local gods, they were alone. What happened? When we went to these big hydraulic civilizations in Mesopotamia, the Middle East, and Turkey, uh, the Indus Valley in India, the Yellow, sea, Yellow River in China, all of these uh, uh, local blood communities were enslaved to create these giant, giant hydraulic civilizations, right? And that's when the great religions formed. All at the same time, not a coincidence, Taoism, Hinduism, Buddhism, Judaism, then later Christianity and Islam. Why? They were attachment figures. They were the new parents. So people began to identify with the religion as their family and they would die for mm -hmm. their family. Totally. Buddhists would die for Buddhists, Hindu for Hindu, Christians for Christians. When you get up to the ideological age, the nation state, which is a fiction, right? It's made up. There was no France, there was no Italy, there was no Germany. They were more localized. But then when you create a nation state and create common um, celebrations and kind of fudge history a little bit and tell everybody there's part of this, people will identify where the nation is, a mother and father figure, and they'll die for their country, right? Totally. What's happening now 
is the young people are now developing biophilia consciousness. They're empathizing as a species with their fellow creatures. Here's the problem. Those other forms of consciousness are still there. We're still, just, right, I talk to you now, there are tribal blood wars right now, this moment going on. There are religious wars going on. There are ideological wars between nations going on. So they haven't disappeared, even though they're not the future. So while the young people are trying to empathize globally as a species with our fellow creatures, the other past consciousness feel threatened. Yeah, the fighting. You follow me? So, but it's possible this time we may make it because one can still feel empathic as a species and to our fellow creatures and you don't have to give up your nation or your, uh, or your religion or your blood ties. You don't have to give those up. Everyone has kind of different ways of seeing it. But as we see ourselves as a species, that's the only way we're going to survive. That's biosphere politics, not geopolitics. Mm. So I, I wanted to say that because I have hope and I think a younger generation, uh, they got to get out of the idea that the answer to this is we need socialism or communism over capitalism, okay? And I've been, uh, you know, my background for 30 years. So all I'm saying is that Karl Marx was right in saying that more, more of the goodies should go to the people who made it, not just the people who, you know, put the capital in. But he was into efficiency. He was into productivity. Totally. He was into adapting nature to us. We've got to move beyond that age of progress schema and the young people need to be introduced. And it's probably going to be through podcasts because they're not reading. They're not reading. But the good thing is podcasts allows them to be storytellers again. So what I'm starting to learn is that there's hope because if they're just on the metaverse, they're not going to make it shorter attention span. But if they're willing to listen for an hour or listen to a podcast for a few hours, maybe the storytelling will get us into the ideas that we're talking about. Yeah, yeah. And, and I feel, I mean, somehow the, 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 the late uh, election in America and the fact that um, Trump or the Republican didn't win somehow, it, makes, it gave me hope also in, in the way you're, you're describing, totally. We're all feeling that today. Yeah, yeah, that's, that's so important. Yeah. People finally said enough of this. And you know what, it's the young people that took it over the young people voted. Yeah. The young, the millennial and Gen Zs, they voted. But also, um, there was enough in our cultural DNA. So we said, you know what, this this is wrong. And this, this, all this fake stuff. And we didn't want to compromise the democratic way of life. And I think that's what carried the day over inflation and everything else. That let's use some common sense here. All right. Um, the one good thing about America, um, Europe and China is leading. And we spent a lot of time there. But Americans are risk takers because uh, except for the slaves and the American Indians who we basically annihilated the American Indians and enslaved the Africans. But other people came over here because they were risk takers. They were willing to take their last dime. And so we will take a risk and spend our last dollar on some future thing that probably won't happen. We're crazy that way. Uh, Europeans are much more conservative that way with bankruptcy and stuff. But once we get it, we can move. So I'm hoping that a younger generation around the world will do that. And I think keep the podcast up. What I would say to you is take this book as just a starting point and because you do a podcast all over the place and ask the same questions we're asking in the book. And totally. get them to go beyond the conversation we're having and beyond the book I wrote. Because I'm convinced it's the journalists the, and the teachers that have to actually bring us into a new story for the human race. I fully agree. I fully agree. Um, so I was going to say the last question I have is the same question for everyone, but I'm going to explain to you a little bit. So the name of the podcast is Vlan. It means uh, slam, slamming the door too. It's in cartoon. And I would like to know what you would like to, whether slam the door to or open the door to. It can be slamming or opening, or it can be both up to you. It can be an idea. It could be uh, whatever Very you like. Soon. We need to slam the door on the idea that nature has to be adapted to our utilitarian needs. Mm. We've got to open the door that we have to adapt to nature because we're part of the living ecology of this planet. We are nature. And that through most of our history, we, we adapted to nature. For the last several thousand years, we, we did something really weird and made nature adapt to our, our needs. And that's taken us to extinction. So I would say slam the door on the age of progress. It's over. It took us to an extinction event. 
open the door to the age of resilience, slam the door to efficiency. It took us to an extinction event. Take us to a new temporal orientation of adaptivity. It opens the door so that we can reaffiliate with this wonderful life force called planet Earth. And you know what? We look out in the universe. We got all the telescopes out there. Dark, nothing going on. This is an incredible, incredible experience. <laughs> we are so fortunate, and all of our species are fortunate to be here. All future organisms should have their moment, their moment. And so this is the this is the time in the next generation. We've got about one generation between today's young people and their children to make this happen. It's possible to move to the age of resilience and a new and a new narrative for the human race. That was amazing, Jeremy. Thank you so much for sharing with us. My pleasure. Thank you. Merci d'avoir écouté Vlan. Si vous avez aimé l'émission, n'hésitez pas à mettre des étoiles sur vos plateformes de podcast préférées. Vous pouvez aussi partager l'épisode sur vos réseaux sociaux, Instagram Stories, Facebook, LinkedIn, où vous voulez. Je suis Grégory Pouy. Vous pouvez me retrouver sur l'intégralité des plateformes sous le nom Greg from Paris. Si vous avez des idées pour des invités, si vous avez des commentaires, n'hésitez surtout pas à m'envoyer un message. Allez, merci et à bientôt